called his name was Walt. <laughs> that is, you know, I always really, I did want mentoring, you know, but back then you, you really couldn't find it. And uh, when we got to Disney, uh, this is a short one, and then we'll go to Big John. And we got to Disney, we had the, you know, we developed Tron completely on our own. And basically with the boycott of the 1980 Olympics, I lost my studio. So I needed a place to go to make Tron, and that was a real torturous road, getting that thing going. But um, we got to Disney, and things were going, and we had the whole movie on story reels, on the storyboards with shots, so you could look at the movie. And I wanted to show it to one of the old Disney nine old men to see what they thought of the movie. And uh, I won't give the name of which one it was, but one of the nine old men sat in the screening room with me, and I thought, this is going to be good. I'm really going to get what I need here. And uh, when it was over, the lights went on. He got up. He started walking out. He said, you're on your own, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, John Shigley. I was the technical effects supervisor. And um, I came out of a background in motion control and, and, and uh, uh, graphics, which, which Richard and I shared a uh, background in making and, and photography and graphics. I think the area that uh, strikes me is that we ended up with the challenge uh, right away and also not having any way of doing the human figure. You know, the Richard was pushing in uh, and did some great work in Triple I with a juggler. There was a big eyeball that looked really cool, an eyeball that might blink. Uh, it was so ahead of in, in the future, we all, like everyone, thought it was maybe uh, six months or five years. It's like the Iraq War is going to end in that long a time. Yeah. There would be a digital character. So one of the first challenges, uh, along with being able to, to create the, the look of the environments, was that uh, the, 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 the human figure had to be added in. And Steve had already come up with, and Harrison had done a test, an optical test, hybrid optical printing technique of putting photographic images together. And just like every movie that gets done now, Tron was a, a Frankenstein collection of everything that worked thrown together to make it move and make it work. And I would say, uh, as an early introduction, you probably need to already seen this. Our, we, here's my both plots and cells, but this ends up being the human figures you might know. It's all 65 photography, uh, black and white, blown up onto frames. Um, Show one of the colas. This is a real cola. That's so you can see the look of it. Here's a, uh, a translucent cola. Beautiful stuff. You can take a look after the show if anyone so, wants. So every frame of the film in the electronic world was blown up like that. So it filled like two tractor trailer trucks. And, uh, and it all went to Taiwan and then came back. Yeah, to get <laughs> John Payne and stuff. But, yeah, John yeah. Madison. But the thing that was interesting about that process, besides the fact that it worked, is that we had underestimated budget-wise. We used to have these panic sessions where shut the door, shut the door, and then we realized the scope of what we were attempting because every one of those frames had to be rephotographed on an animation stand and had to be exposed for every separate color. Wow. So the whites of the eyes, the flesh of the skin, the different costumes. So each frame of the electronic world had to be exposed about. 15 times, sometimes 30 times. And um, it was pretty gargantuan undertaking, but it was a system, and it worked. And when we finally sat down with Disney, and I thought they were really going to freak out, and, they, and when we find out that we've underestimated the work required, they did freak out, but they got it. It, it was like an animated movie. They were familiar with doing that kind of large Yeah, they, you know, any other studio, it, it, I don't know what would have happened, but at Disney they went, well, okay, you have 500,000 of these and 600,000 of these, and we'll just shoot them, you know? And, <laughs> and so I give a lot of credit to Disney for, you know, understanding what we yeah, were trying to do. And another little odd note is those colas were never made like regular film stock. The, the, the cola is made for graphics, so every time there would be a batch change, every few hundred times there would be an exposure pop. And Steve would look at these, I remember you saying in, those, in the day, it's like, well, it's just the way it is in the electronic world. You know, when you have an exposure pop, you put it over the exposure pop. That, we figured out how to solve that problem when we 
realized that we had to work with the batches as Kodak made them, but that's yeah. too technical. And <laughs> just just to put this a little bit into context, the electronic world, you know, when when they're all inside the computer, is about 53 minutes worth of the movie. And if you start doing some math, 53 minutes times 60 seconds, you know, in a minute, uh, times 24 frames per second, you wind up with 75,000 frames times you know, uh, how, how are we, four, five, you know, 15, you know, all of that stuff, you wind up with a stack of cells that if you stack them five feet high, would run from the screen all the way into the store next door. Well, so it actually takes up a, a, a vault, you know, a, a physical volume, and all that stuff has to be moved, and it all has to be. Uh, and it was processed. all handwork. It wasn't computer. It was amazing computer work that Richard will talk about. It was digital, but it was. It was digital. <laughs> the, the thing was that the film was really handmade, other than the computer simulation part, and a lot of that was handmade in a way. But literally, uh, you know, we shot 65 millimeter, and we photorotted to make these big cells and they were inked and painted. Uh, all of it was sent to Taiwan to do the inking and painting and come back. And there was, you know, 10, 15, 20 exposures per frame. We had 18 backlit animation cameras. We had eight scene coordinators. Each one of them was responsible for X number of scenes in the film. They all had to write these massive exposure sheets, keep track of all these elements. The logistics were, I mean, nobody will ever do that again. <laughs> but people thought that the computer had stylized that imagery in, in the electronic world. And it, it was really hand done. Yeah, yeah. As Steve will tell you, uh, on the Tron Legacy, when you look at the, if you ever see any of the tapes uh, from the effect shots in the bottom, you see the slate with the tape number. And those tapes will go up to like 122 takes on an effect shot. And on our movie, if they got one take that basically where Richard would say, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if there are little things popping or going on and off, like, like cameras, yeah, that's not a computer world. Yeah, we were going so fast. And, you know, we had 15 minutes of solid computer-generated animation in the film that went with the other, it was like more like 60 minutes and 15 minutes. And um, one frame of the atmospheric explosion in the light cycle sequence of Tron Legacy has more computing power in that one frame than in this whole movie. Yeah. I think my phone has more computing power. <laughs> <laughs> Let, Stephen, let's talk a little bit about the story, you know, because it, it, that's where it starts. Yeah. Give us some background into the inspirations and the, the commentary that you're trying to make. Well, you know, it, it is... It was a different time back then, you know, it was, things really go through cycles, and it was a time that we felt empowered if we could work in the realm of the unknown. Today, people feel empowered if they can work in real time in an interactive way. I mean, it, it was ridiculous how uninteractive this technology was back then. I saw the first finished frame, one frame of the film when the movie was half done. And up until that point, I had never seen what Tron was going to look like, but I was shooting it and making it and just pretending I did know what it was going to look like. <laughs> so, you know, it was an era when, you know, I'll use the word founding, but we were founding a technology. and. Um, I don't know. I was I was really confident because we uh, I felt the story was solid because I spent so many years working on it and interviewing the people that were behind this, and um, I just there was something about being the first one there. It in, it in, it inspired me tremendously, and then when I had the the right team around me, I thought, what could be better than this? You have this new technology, you have enough money, and it's it's going to be this great group of artists and, and film technicians that are you know so talented, and we're gonna get there first. You know, and th that was just really exhilarating. And it's a different time today, you know, it's people talk about originality. Um, 
this is a more reactive time when people are trying to, you know, make things more, how do I put it, more practical for wider applications to make things real, you know. You, you, you build a Wright Brothers plane and then later on you build a, a jetliner that carries people around the world. That's the time we're in now, you know, where we're, we're making things for everyone compared to making these leaps of faith that we made back then. And I think that's okay, you know, I think that's part of the cycle. Um, but it, it was really exciting to be first. Um, in terms of the, the story, it was, uh, it was inspired partially by Spartacus. I like that movie, I'm a 60s person, and the idea of a revolution um, was in the air. You know, we felt that the technology, computers, was in, that were only in the hands of IBM, and one day, if we, we, we naively believed that the world would be perfect if we could just get those tools and get them in our hands. You know, if, if we all had a computer, nothing could stop us. And uh, that, was, that was in the air. That was something that motivated us, the belief in that. And of course, you know, that turned out to be true, because the world's perfect now. <laughs>